Good morning, church. Um, so happy that you're here with us. Unfortunately, we are away at vacation right now, uh, but we'll be back live next week. So if you could please stand with us, we're going to get worship started.
So come now, Lord, like never before.
All right, so that was our 2017 trunk or treat. We didn't have one last year because it rained out. If you guys were here, you knew that. So um, we are so excited about our 2019 trunk or treat. And what it is is that we have churches in our community that come together as one, and we have a great time. So we are going to be at the Carnival Grounds. Uh, here in Smithsburg, and we have lots of trunks set up. We have moon bounces. We have uh, this year we're going to be adding a new area for refuge. So it's going to be the teen hangout area. So it's for families, teens, kids. Um, we're going to have a great time. So it's going to be October 25th. So make sure you save the date because we need volunteers. We need people to bring trunks. We need help of all kinds because without you guys this event cannot be possible for a community when we had the event in 2017 and the year before that we know there was at least a thousand people that attended the event so we want to make sure there's plenty of trunks for all those kids to go trunk or treating in and then also that it's just a great time so we are expecting a huge crowd again because when we did the rain date last year we went ahead and we set the date for this year so all the people that wanted to come last year already know about the date and we continue to push out the date so please put that on your calendar and please consider being a part of that if you are interested in helping in that in any way just put trunk on your connection card and we will get you more information well welcome my name is Angela and we want to welcome you to Smithsburg Valley Church we are so glad you're here because you belong here and we're a church reaching the tri-state area with a vision and that is to be a church that the unchurched loves to experience and our mission if you guys can say with me following Jesus changing together if you are new this Sunday, make sure you stop out at the cafe. It's right out front there and grab you a free gift. And that's to say thank you for checking us out and spending part of your Sunday with us. And we always have fun things going on. You guys know that we have been uh, preaching on and just talking about being in groups, being in life together, being for our city and all those great things. So there are sign-up sheets still out there. If you are not in a small group, if you have not signed up for a small group, we want you to do so. So out in the information area, there is um, papers lined up, and it has when they're meeting, where they're meeting, who's the leader, who's in the group, things like that, to give you kind of a little bit more information about those groups. So make sure you put your name down on that list because life is better connected. If you want more information about that, you can also use your connection card and just put groups on there. You can use your connection card to sign up for two teen notes. You can submit prayer requests. You can let us know where you are in your Jesus journey, and we will collect those up at the end of the service. Now it's time for our offering, if our ushers could come forward. And because of what you guys give, we can do things like trunk or treat. So thank you so much for giving, because without those funds, we could not make this event possible. So thank you. We can also give online or use your smartphone. And if you are new with us, please feel free to let the offering plate pass. That's something that our regular members and attenders do to take care of our needs. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you give us. And we just ask that you be with Pastor Clint as he comes forward with the message, that you would be able to share the words, that they would resonate in our heart, that we would be able to hear something that we've never heard before, that it would touch our heart so deeply that it would make a lasting impression, and that we'd be able to know your love more and go out to the community and share your love. Amen. Ask someone where they're from, and they'll likely give you a name of a city. It's how we identify the place we call home. Some will answer with excited pride, others with embarrassed shame. Some are quick to share their city's every highlight, while others shine a spotlight on every ugly detail they can find. But what is it that makes the difference? The difference is made in how we answer this question. Do I happen to live inside a city, or am I a part of the city I live in? Is it an external entity to criticize, or a community that I'm connected to? Are these statistics just numbers, or are they my neighbors? Are we making fun of problems or real people? Are these headlines or humans? So if you ask me, do I live in this city, or is this my city? My answer would have to be, this is my city. 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 This, this is, is our city. city. Good morning. I'm, I'm Pastor Clint, and uh, I want to welcome you to Sister Valley Church. Uh, and uh, it was exciting to do worship differently this morning. Uh, it's, it's awesome to um, be able to use the technology we have, God's blessed us with, to do that. Um, it's a little bit different not having live worship, but it was still cool to do that. Uh, it's cool that God's provided those things to do that, So, and our, our talented people to do that. Um, so I just wanted to say that was cool. Uh, it was cool to hear you guys sing and in a different way than we've been having experience with you guys so far. Uh, so I thought that was neat. 
Uh, but we're in a series, right? Uh, it's for our city. And so that's what we do, right? We pick a topic, we talk about it for a few weeks, and, and this is more than just a topic, though. This is actually a group of sermon series, whatever you want to call it, um, that is affecting about 20 or so churches in the area, cross-denominationally. So maybe you've heard, like, I don't do that organized church thing or organized religion. Well, what if organized, what if churches actually did get organized? <laughs> like, what if we actually put our stuff aside and started loving people for Jesus? And that's what this is about. This is uh, for our city. So we want to put all that stuff aside and purposely love our communities for Jesus. And so this, this sermon series, we're in week three of it, and, and we're going to talk about something today that's going to probably affect all, it definitely affects all of us in one way or another, and it's a little bit different maybe this series, uh, this sermon, uh, than you maybe thought you were going to talk about at church today, but uh, I have the opportunity to talk about it, so it's going to be good to go through it. And so we're, we'll start out, this, this sermon is called, Your Freedom Brings Freedom. And I want to start with a question. Are we living truly free? And a lot of times we think we are. We're like, oh yeah, I'm free. And if we're a Jesus follower, we definitely should, we should be. Um, but if we look at the statistics and stuff like that, there, it's probably a good chance we're not. So we're going to talk through that. And, and looking at it as a society and as a, as a community, there's some issues in it. And one of the biggest issues that we see in this area and what we're trying to focus with in this sermon series uh, is addiction. And so you don't have to go very far, right? All you've got to do is go to Smithsburg, or you can go to Hagerstown for sure, and see that there's an opioid crisis in our area, right? I want to show you a statistic that I, that I ran across that is really devastating. It talks about Maryland. It says in, t- in 2017, there were uh, 1,985 overdose deaths involving opioids in Maryland, uh, a rate of 32.2 deaths per 100,000 persons. This number is twofold greater than the national rate of 14.6 deaths per 100,000 persons. The rate ranks in the top five opioid-related overdose deaths rates with the largest increase attributed to cases involving synthetic opioids. So that doesn't necessarily mean heroin. It means your, ca- your, your medicine cabinet. And there, I don't know of anybody who's addicted to, her, uh, to prescription drugs in this room, but you know what? Statistics say that there's probably somebody that is, and it doesn't mean that it's the guy holding the, the sign at the corner. It probably is the, the mom who just uh, has to take too many pills to get through the day. It's the, it's the normal person. That's, the, that's what they're saying is it's just someone who takes the edge off too much, and it can, can spiral. As a matter of fact, 70 to 75 to 82 percent of heroin users start using heroin because they started with prescription drugs, is what the statistics show us. And so uh, you you say, well, okay, okay, that's not me. Yeah, I get that. I understand that. But there are addictions in our lives and other things that are that are bondage that we're going to talk about. And there's there's a spiritual issue underlying with that for sure. And so um, this thing's bugging me. and so the, the thing is, though, uh, one of the things I ran across this, and I thought this was crazy. This is something I would never even think about. A, a statistic came out in January of 2019. That America, in America, you're more likely to die from an overdose than you are to die in a vehicle accident. Isn't that insane? Like, I think cars are dangerous sometimes. Like, I drive stupid sometimes. And so I think they're dangerous sometimes, like, to be personal. But pill bottles are dangerous, and, they, and, and they're in everyone's cabinets, and so that's what it's telling me, and, and I thought that was interesting, and, and, and it's not just um, adults making these decisions, it's students, so I, I talked about this at Refuge Thursday, Refuge is our student outreach, and I'm going to talk about it tomorrow night, too, in Hagerstown, at, at our other location, and so, because statistics say that 18% of high schoolers are already leaning towards or addicted to prescription medicines, and where do they get those, because they don't have prescription pads, right? And they don't take themselves to the doctors. So be aware that your medicine cabinets might be feeding their addictions. And so be aware of that, uh, just as an awareness. But there's an issue there uh, that, that this, the churches want to talk about. We want to be aware of it. 
Because if we're not talking about it, we're leaving it up to the world to talk about it. And that's just, see that, when it comes to addiction, it's just a symptom to a problem that is actually a spiritual problem, right? And so what I want to transition is to not just a, a they problem, as we walk down Hagerstown, as we talk about Washington County or Frederick County, which is why I have this purple shirt on. So how many of you guys have heard of Washington County Goes Purple? A couple of you guys. Our students know about it. It's something that's an initiative to help students understand that, that there is an opioid crisis, be aware, to raise awareness. The teachers got t-shirts. I'm, I work for Washington County uh, Public Schools. And I'm a bus attendant. I help with special needs and behaviors. We were supposed to get the shirts, but like they ran out or something. So like we're not as cool as teachers, I guess. But the teachers got them. We didn't. But um, my wife's a teacher, so I'm lucky because Frederick County got t-shirts for their teachers. So I borrowed hers today. Uh, so I'm wearing that because it's that big a deal. It's that big a deal that the students need to see it every single Friday, the purple shirts, this awareness is that big a deal. They need to know about it. Um, but addiction's all over the place, and it's actually in the church. And this is how I know that, because things like this describe us. Let me see if these words describe any of you guys. And I know they describe me in my life sometimes. Go to the next slide. Uh, next two slides, I guess. And then we'll go back to the video. Do these words ever describe who you are? Words like stuck, chains, hurt, pain, shame, regret, excuses, scars. I mean, we all can relate to some of those words, right? But do those words really ex describe people who are truly living free? I want to show you a video of someone who sh is gracious enough to share his, his uh part of his testimony, part of his story with us, and this kind of the, some of the words that he describes it with. Hey, I'm Kevin Hatch. I was, uh, they call a PK, preacher's kid. I'm actually the preacher's kid of a preacher's kid. Couldn't have asked for a better, a better home situation, better family. Around the age of 17, you know, like a lot of teenagers, got a little rebellious and started dabbling with uh, alcohol a little bit. By the time I had reached 19, I started to realize that I may have a little bit of a problem. I went to a couple AA meetings, um, and listening to them, honestly, I, I was like, okay, I was wrong. Like, that's, that's not me. When in actuality, it was the beginning of all of that. Jump forward a little bit, when I was 23, my father passed away due to some complications of uh, heart surgery. Losing him was a huge hit, and the bottle was my best friend. I mean, it, it just, it took away the pain. I'm an extroverted person anyway, but it just helped me go that extra mile when I was in the public eye. If I was out at a party or something, you know, I was the life of the party. And that's, that was great for me because I could just escape reality and just be whoever I wanted to be in those people's eye. The more I got into the music scene, DJing and hip hop and whatnot, I started doing that regularly. It helped dictate who I thought I was. Instead of me being the authentic me, the alcohol became who I was. And so to get to where I could even function properly, I would have to start the day with a drink and got to the point where the drinking was way out of control. I was no longer in control. The bottle was completely in control. You know, I met my wife in 2002. She was aware of my drinking in the beginning, but not to the full extent. We had our first child, our daughter Ayla, in 2012. And that wasn't even enough to really kick sobriety in. In 2014, I uh, created a record label, a little independent imprint and I'd actually been sober for a while when I was first getting the business end of it started I was so focused on just that that everything else was taking a back seat and it led me right back into into more drinking the rock bottom if you will was our separation in 2016 I went through some ups and downs um, a couple different rehabs was there for a few months, thought I had myself together, moved out. It was from there that I ended up in the emergency room a handful of times within a two week period and then finally reached out for some help. You know, his story 
some things stood out to me that he just he said he was it was his the bottle seemed like his best friend and that he lost control that it had control over him and that's what addiction does it, it things take over for for us and it doesn't have to be drinking maybe you don't drinking is something you don't do or you if not it's not that maybe it's smoking maybe it's being popular maybe it's drama i mean drama is addicting right i want to i want to be conf- confess with you right now okay so um one of the shows that I've been watching right now is Jane the Virgin. Weird name. But it's like a Mexican uh, soap opera, okay? I think it's a spoof of one. But anyway, it's funny, and it's, it catches my attention and my wife my justification. I watch it with my wife, okay? So I'm not, I don't just sit around and watch it. But I watch it with my wife, and, um, but it sucks me in. I'm like, are you serious? Like, He's with her, and that dude's dead, and now he's alive, and like, how'd that happen? And I, 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 it's crazy. But it, why does it do that? Why is that show addictive? Because of drama. And that, that's entertainment. That's funny. It, it's, it, it's fun. But sometimes drama, like some, some of the stuff that people are going through, their, their lives are just so messy, and maybe their, their lives just have to have drama in them. You know people like that, right? Just drama is what they thirst for. And, but if you ask them, they hate drama, right? Oh, I hate drama. I can't stand drama. But that's all they absorb. That's all they have. Maybe they're addicted to drama. Uh, but then there's other people that are addicted to all kinds of things, right? They're, whatever it is, we, we sometimes feel stuck with these addictions. And next slide for me. Um, we have to know where we can go with that. And so I want to tell you a story, okay? And we could have re- read it directly from the Bible, but I'm going to try to paint a picture for you. I'm going to try to tell you this story in a way that it kind of comes to life. And many of you maybe have heard this story. Maybe it's the first time you've heard this story. Uh, but it has to deal with change. It has to deal with freedom. And it has to be deal, deal with uh, some really cool things. And, and, and it's not a direct correlation. It's not a scriptural diagram of freedom and, and what we're talking about with addiction. Because the person in the story is not dealing with addiction. They're dealing with something way worse, I think. Uh, they're dealing with spiritual warfare. And so the story picks up. It's in March, Mark uh, 5, 1 through 12. If you want to follow along, you can. Uh, But actually, all three, three out of four of the Gospels in the first part of the New Testament cover this story. That's how important it is. Usually, we kind of base uh, an account. Anything in the Bible is important. I mean, let's get real. But if... If, if an author or, or someone repeats it more than once, it's really important, right? We kind of put it, at, say it's, hey, it's pretty important. And so all three authors, uh, three out of four of these, of the apostles, give us this information. And so we get a little bit of information from each one, uh, which is cool. Uh, just like if you see a car accident and you've got a couple different witnesses, you can say, well, you know, they were speeding, they ran a lie. You kind of piece the story together. So we, we'll do that. We'll, I'll walk you through it. All right, so Jesus has got off of a boat, right? He comes across this, this little lake, ocean, uh, not ocean, sea. He comes across, and he finds this guy who's living in a graveyard. Now, a graveyard in the first century is not like a graveyard like you and I know, okay? It's not like this nice, mode, wonderful little place by Memorial Park up the road, okay? A graveyard is a cave full of rotting bodies, okay? Cave area full of rotting bodies. It's not pleasant, and it's outside of town. So if you live there, you're an outcast. You're, 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 it's isolation. You're all by yourself. There's nobody else that's going to come visit you. No lunches at the graveyard. Okay? That's, that's, the where, that's kind of where he's at. So Jesus shows up. There's a guy that's living there, and that's where he has to live because he's possessed by demons. So he doesn't have, spirit, he doesn't have addiction. He's literally possessed by demons. And he he's actually has to be chained up. So, I brought some chains that I bought online for a visual. So, this guy gets chained up. The people in town don't know what to do with him. He beats himself with rocks. He's naked all the time. He screams. He yells. He sees Jesus coming. He runs and he falls on his face. And, and the demons inside him recognize Jesus and they know who he is. This is cool. The guys that are living with Jesus and following Jesus, sometimes we wonder, like, do they even know who Jesus is? Right? Like, do they really get who Jesus is? Like, this is God. But no, the demons know who he is, right? They say, you are the living son of God. 
do not torture us. Do not torture me. It's amazing. And then he's, so this guy's laying on his face, and, and Jesus uh, says, get out. And then he asks their name. And it, they say, our name is Legion, for we are many. So here's a history lesson for you, a quick one. Um, and it's important because scholars believe this, that, that a legion, okay, in the, in the Roman army is 10,000 men. So scholars would say, but based on that name, that information that the, the demons are giving, is that there's 10,000 demons living in this one dude. Now, the guy or girl who cut you off this week, on, you know, and you're like, how many demons are living in that dude? I'm pretty sure they didn't have 10,000 living in them. But this guy had 10,000 demons living in him, all right? And so wrap it up, the story. And so Jesus allows those demons to go and some pigs. Now, if you're a PETA member, you're very upset about the pigs, they do fly off a cliff and die. I'm sorry. Now, if you're a first century Jew, you're cheering when Jesus is telling this story because they hate, Jew they hate pigs, right? Uh, pork is forbidden. So they're happy. But... Uh, and why there was pigs in the area really is bad because they're not supposed to be in, that, in, in, in Israel. But anyway, so they go off and they die. The, the demons drive them off a cliff. We'll pick up with that story in just a little bit. So let's go back to our life, right? You and I, how does this apply to us? Because Jesus allows us to understand these stories because they're real life things. These don't, aren't just stories. These aren't fables. These are real life accounts. All right, of what's happened, what Jesus did because of who he was as God, but they apply to our lives, and we want to know that. We don't just read the Bible just to know what happened. We want to read it and so that we understand it, and so I want to say this. Life sometimes leaves us oppressed, chained up, broken, cut, and isolated. I mean, that's very, very true. Life is hard. Life is messy, right? But I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to start living free? And that's a no-brainer, right? We, we, of, course, of course I am. And the truth is that as a Christian, we have the opportunity to do that if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, the question would be the same. Are you ready to start living free? And the answer would be Jesus. And that brings us to our next slide. The essence of Jesus' mission and purpose is freedom. Some people think that Jesus came just so that he can provide this book of rules. That's not it. Jesus didn't come to make you a better person. That's not why. Jesus isn't looking for robots. Jesus came because he wants to set you free from the bondage of sin. And he wants to bridge the gap that sin has created so that you can be reunited in a relationship with God. That's the purpose, right? That's the only reason he came. And think about that. He, God, put on flesh. The Bible says he stepped out of the cosmos. That's how the Greek translates it cosmos, stepped across heavens, the universe, put on a dirt suit, became a baby, had to have his diapers changed. Can you imagine that? The God of the universe happened to have his diapers changed. Grew up, died a horrible death, then rose again and conquered death for you and for me, all on a mission so that he could set you free from sin. And so this is why it's, I love this phrase, this statement, this is wonderful, and, and I got it from the message that they provided for us with this sermon series, and I love it. This is why he came, to weave a God, and there's an asterisk there on purpose, because it's not a self-help thing. There's millions of self-help books out there. Look it up on Amazon, right? This is not it. You cannot do this yourself. This is not AA. I value those things, whatever, but this is not it. This is a God threaded thread of freedom into the tapestry of our lives and history. It's the only God thing. God is the only one that can do it. Only a freedom he can provide. And maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know what, I'm not an addict. I'm not a heroin addict. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not, I've, maybe I've dealt with things in the past, but I'm not there now. I'm just a regular person. Sure, I've got sin. I'm not perfect, but I'm not an addict. And you know what? The Bible talks to you too because the Bible, there was a group of people that were thinking the exact same thing. They're called the Pharisees. And they said this, they were saying that to Jesus. And Jesus says this, out it. He says, how can you say that? We shall not be set free. That you shall not be set free. That we shall not be set free. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone 
who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, talking about Jesus, you will be set free indeed. So I was thinking about that this week, and I was like, how do I unpack that, that passage? When you're a slave, right, in first century um, Middle East, you're not a part of the house, right? You're, you're, you're owned by the house, right? You, you cannot be part of the house. You are a possession of the house. You have no status. But if you become a son, if you're adopted, you now have a status change. If you update your status on Facebook, that's a status change, right? So if you become a Jesus follower, you've gone through a status change. You are no longer a slave. You are now a son or daughter. It's a status change. We understand that concept, a status change. I'm in a relationship, not a relationship, whatever it is, status change. It's an update. And it's a totally different thing than one from the other. So that's good. That's a good news because if I'm a Jesus follower, then that means that I'm no longer a slave to the sin. So I'm not in this status anymore at all. I'm in a whole new category. I still deal with sin, but I'm no longer bound to sin. I have the power to overcome sin, right? I can overcome sin. When I'm stuck here and I'm a slave, I have no other option. I'm going to be a slave till I die. That's the way it works, right? Slavery is, there's no freedom until freedom is granted. But with sonship, it's different. You'll be, and a son, Jesus, is the only one who can set us free. And it is truly freedom. The next slide, our freedom leads to death. When I try to do it on my own, how many of you guys would say, honestly, okay, I'm going to try to break that habit. I'm going to break that cycle. I'm, I've told myself that a million times. I'm going to do it on my own. When you tell yourself honestly, it never works, right? You always get back into it. The guy on the video, right? He would do it for a little bit. And even life things that were beneficial, like he got married, he had a kid, he started a new job, and it was good for a while, but then those things, that they, come back, they come back to you. But God's freedom leads to life, and not just eternal life, even though is there really such a thing as just eternal life? I mean, eternal life is amazing, if you think about it. But life, as in life, is I can have a real life. I can have joy, I can have peace, I can have, I can have passion for life again. So many times in a church we get lukewarm. We just start going through the motions. We as a church sometimes lack passion. Our Monday through Fridays look passionless. I don't know. That's not life to me. Jesus said he came to bring life and bring it more abundantly. Freedom allows us to do that. When Jesus set us free, a thread of freedom is woven into our lives so that we begin to live free. Whenever you run a thread through something, right, when it's woven through a tapestry, it goes throughout the whole thing. I mean, it makes a huge difference. And without that thread, it all, it all comes undone. When freedom is really in our lives, the freedom of Jesus, it makes a huge difference. I mean, when a, when a convict gets set free, life's different. I went and I bought a weight set this week from somebody, and the guy said, well, I bought this before I was incarcerated. I was like, okay. I didn't get a chance to talk to him more than that, but I was like, man, I bet this guy's life's really different now that he's not in jail anymore. And I was a little nervous, to tell you the truth, when I was at his house. Um, it was in Baltimore. Uh, and so, anyway, our life changes. We're set free. There's difference. And so now I want to go back to our story just real quick as we go there. And so the chains were broken. So the guy in the story, right, uh, he goes and he, he's, he's, he's changed. He's been set free from these demons. And he goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want, I want to give you my life. I want to go on the road with you. And Jesus says, no. I want you to stay where you're at. And Luke gives us some really cool information. He gives us some insight. He says, this guy was naked, I say it funny, I guess, naked, and now he is clothed. That's key information, because if any of you guys were naked, I would notice, right? If I was naked, you guys would notice. 
And if I stopped being naked, we would all praise and be happy, right? And same with you. So that's true about his community. They all noticed this dude had clothes on. And Luke points it out and says, this guy who was naked is not naked anymore. He's normal. There's some normalcy there. It was a good status for him, clothed. And so his life was different. And Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to plant you right back where you're supposed to be in your very spot. And you're going to make a difference because you now live free from your demons. And the truth is that God's not, maybe not putting you on a foreign field to do this or do that. But he's put you right exactly in your spot so that, so that people can see how God has set you free. But if you're not living free, they're not seeing anything different. You're just naked. You're just the same old naked person, right? And so that's, that's a problem, right? So we, we want to live free. God's freedom brings freedom. That was our, that's the point of our message. It, it, God's freedom brings freedom. When, we live, when we're living free, we can help others see that Jesus can set them free. Just like the guy in the story. People are going to look at him and say, you know what? I like your new clothes. I'm so glad you're not naked anymore. You, you lost the chains. The rocks are gone. Don't you feel better? What happened? Well, it's an interesting story. There was these pigs. He didn't really probably leave with that, right? He didn't say these pigs. He probably said, Jesus came on a boat, and God set me free. How do you start your story? If you're living free, it should start with, Jesus set me free. Often we say, well, I went to this, I went to that, and life changed, and I got, you know, I got out of this, and I got out of that. I got married, I got this, life circumstances. But really, if it's change, it should start with Jesus. And so this is what it looks like to live free. Let me give you some practical stuff here, and then we're almost done. Living free is, gives you the chance to be free to love. I mean, think about that. If you're really living free, you can love somebody. That means you can actually look at somebody on the side of the street in Hagerstown, right? Someone holding a sign or just some, you know, the people we kind of look at maybe outside the window and are like, you know, they're obviously going down the wrong path. And look at them and say, you know what? I love them only because or solely upon the fact that Jesus loves them. That's a starting point for me. And I'll be completely honest with you. As I preach this, it's not my strong point. As a pastor, I always want to be transparent with you. That's not where my heart always goes. Okay? I, I'm not any better than you guys. I want to be completely clear with you. That's not where I go all the time. But I'm convicted with this. When, as I study and as I, as I prepare this stuff. Free to love. That's the way it is with the refuge kids. I tell them. And if you're one of my leaders, you hear me. We love you because you're here, because Jesus loves you. It starts there. We're free to love because it starts there. Free of shame. Could you imagine? What if you opened up your checkbook and you were following God's path with that and you didn't have to feel shame? What would it be like? What if everything was hitting on all cylinders? What if it was like that with your, your marriage? What if it was like that with your personal relationships? Whatever it is, I don't know. I'm just throwing out what ifs. Who knows? I could do that all day, right? Whatever God's laying on your heart, free of shame, free of regret, that unforgiveness, that bitterness, whatever it is that we got in our life, if we're free from that, it's just like the chains just, just like drop. And now we can see, and others can see Jesus in us. And the most important thing is free to have a future. I'm going to share something with you, and I'm conflicted about this because I didn't get permission to do this. But I don't think it'll, she'll be watching. So my sister has struggled with addiction for years. And so right now she's living in, in the woods in Missouri somewhere. And she's facing seven years in prison. She's dealt with addiction for so long. She says she's a Jesus follower, but I just don't know, honestly. There's no fruit in her life. And th 
I don't know what our future looks like. So my hope is that someday she'll know Jesus in a way that she can see and have a future. Addiction and stuff just gets in the way of our future. Living free is how we can be for our city. We can look at our city and we can be mad about it. Some of you guys grew up in Hagerstown, around Hagerstown, and you can look at it and say, this place is gone and down the tubes, and I'm so upset about it. I move here, I'm, I'm new to here, so I don't know. It doesn't look so great to me, <laughs> really, honestly. But I can be mad about it, or we can be for our city. And the way that we do that is by sharing and loving, sharing the gospel. You know, there's laws that are going to be changed. You know, we can take Big Pharma to jail, we can do all that stuff, that stuff's in the news right now. That might be the answer. I'm not against that or for that. The pulpit's not the place for me to share that, experience, that opinion. But I know for sure that Jesus is the answer. The gospel is the answer. It was the answer for our, our buddy in the video, and uh, he wants to share the rest of his story. Here's the rest of his story. The summer of 17, I went to uh, Teen Challenge. Um, after a lot of prayer, and, and talking with a lot of people, you know, I realized that, yes, I have this, you know, disorder. You know, it, it's, it's a chemical imbalance in my brain, and that I'll never escape. But alcohol doesn't have this magic power over me. So after uh, eight months at Teen Challenge, I came home and uh, just really started to turn my life around. At this point, Jess and I had been separated for close to two years. And we didn't just get right back together. It's been a difficult journey, but it, it needed to happen not only for me and my life, but for the life of my family, my, my family being reunited and just how we get along our relationship today. It, th those are prayers answered. I'm in a really good place now. Uh, the things with my DJing and music career are going really well. With, with how important music is, I've realized that Everything else has to come first. God has to be in my life first. My sobriety has to be first. My family has to be first. And now I think I have a really, I'm, I'm maintaining a really good balance without it being a trigger or something that is gonna, gonna hinder my sobriety. With the help of the Lord and strong support system, you know, I've been able to maintain 19 months of sobriety. Things are really working out in ways that I could have never imagined. So I give all the thanks to God for you know, helping me through this and, and showing me the, the path that I needed to be on. It's awesome to hear a story of his transformation, his life change, restoration, his marriage and things. And, and he's, he's the first one to tell you, he said it wasn't easy. It's been a process. And that's true. I mean, it would be nice if it was just like a, everything changes and everything's nice and, and perfect. But we know it's not like that. I have a friend who leads a ministry called Freeway in Springfield, where I'm from, and actually has, he's grown to be an international ministry in the few years that I've known him, but he he's got saved in prison, and I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people are impacted. People actually, when I was in college, I used to catch people shoplifting. That was my job for Walmart. I loved it, but it it was gratifying, but I dealt with the same demographic every day, and it was really hard, too, to not be jaded. And anyway, some of those people that I actually caught, and I knew where their life was, futureless and whatever else, are now completely transformed, completely changed, in Bible college. They've gone through discipleship courses. Their, their lives are restored. They had their children's back, like kids, custody of their kids. Like, they're just, they're just amazing. They're business owners. I mean, it's just awesome. Uh, and he has a part of that. And so it's really cool. I had to see his ministry grow. And, and um, so my hope is that if you know someone that doesn't know Jesus, that you'll be sharing your story. If your life is a mess and, and you're trapped up and, and whatever else that you need to be set free from, today's the day to, to give it to Christ. I mean, today's the day to, to make sure that you're going that direction. Because Jesus is the answer. 
So I want everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. I don't want anyone to walk around, walk away today without the opportunity to know Christ personally. Because I believe 100% it's not about religion. It's not about going to church. It's not about going through the motions. But it's about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I said earlier it was his mission to set us free. That he came and he died for us. Because every single one of us has a sin problem. We're all guilty of that, and, and he wants to fix that. And the way he fixed that is by dying for us on a cross. And so if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to choose to follow him. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but it's not the prayer that saves you. It's, it's not magic words or anything like that. But it's you crying out to God, giving your life to him, and starting a relationship with him. Say something like this. Say, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe that you died and that you rose again for me. Jesus, I want you to come into my life. I want to start a relationship with you today, right now. Forgive me of my sin. I want to learn to love you back. Now, with no one looking around, no one, um, I'm not going to call you out or anything like that, but I just want you to raise your hand. I'd just like to have that visual of if any decisions made, but also would ask for you to also fill out a connection card for us. Let us know of any decisions. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. Today's the day you say, you know what, I've been a Jesus follower, but I haven't been living like it. I haven't been giving Jesus my all. I haven't been living like Jesus is my all. Pray something right now and just give your life to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm all in. Maybe I've been on the fence, but today I'm all in. If today is the day you've recommitted or made any decisions, make sure you fill it out on the card. It's just a way for us to communicate with a big setting like this. And God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna clo- to close in prayer, and that prayer with you guys, and then we're going to have uh, a little bit of information, and we'll have one last song. God, you're an amazing God. You show up time and time again. In amazing, amazing ways. And you've set us free. Free from a bondage that we can't break on our own. And my prayer is that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, God, that they will make that decision. That they will fall in love with you. That they will choose to follow you. It's not easy. Sometimes. But it is a free gift. And God, also I pray that those who are following you, that they would give it, their, they'd be all in. Let us be examples of your freedom in our city. Let this room be full, God, of people on fire for you and passion for you, God. We want to be a church that's in love with you in an amazing way so that everyone around us knows it. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we've been doing this series, we've also had a reading plan. So I want to encourage you guys to be in that. Uh, It's a reading plan that um, anytime you're in the Word of God, you know, you may feel disconnected from God. You may feel like God's not answering your prayers. Uh, And my first question is always going to be, and it's my question I ask myself too, is are you reading his love letters? And if the answer is no, then here's a good good, good way to get plugged into that. Uh, It's in your bulletin. Um, And... The challenge, of course, is on your bulletin, too. So the challenge is take the next three weeks, commit to, act, to the act of acting the art of neighboring, caring about or being a good neighbor to four closest homes to you and four people who are near to you at work or school. You're going to get to know them, serve them, and become a friend of them uh, who Jesus has called you to love. So if you're, make sure you're making connections. You know what? Isolation leads you to nowhere. I mean, that's really true. Uh, if, if, if you, um, someday, you will stand in front of Christ. This is 100% true. And Jesus will look at you and say, how many people did you help come to me? That's something we're going to be accountable for. I don't say that in be a fearful way, but the Bible clearly talks about it. And so I want you guys to be able to say, I, I brought as many people as I could, Lord. 
by the way I acted, by the way I loved, by the way I was free, and the way I shared with my mouth about Jesus. And, and so getting to know people is important. I met a lot of people this week. Uh, one of them actually is my neighbor. It wasn't by intentionality, I'll be honest. I didn't go down and knock on his door. I sold something, and it turned out he lives, I can see his garage from my back door. So that's cool. I invited him to church, and we kind of started talking. It was neat. Uh, God worked that out. So getting to know people is really important. Uh, but I know it can be tough, too. Uh, so I, I get that. But that's a challenge. That's why it's a challenge. We want to try to do that. So now, if you'll stand, we're going to do our last song, and then we'll be dismissed. an ocean deeper than fear the tide is rising
Thank you, church. I hope you have an awesome week. We'll see you next time. Make sure you share the live stream.